Rockham. Uh, this is a bit of a different video, uh, but has a more important message to tell all. It isn't about a fallen hero. This is an honest to goodness living hero, and many living heroes that battled to keep her alive. This is the story of my stepdaughter, Amethyst Sapphire Topaz Jade Williamson. Amish was born on Monday the 12th of September 1994, eight weeks premature, a very unexpected arriving just two days before her big brother's first birthday. Her lung collapsed halfway after her birth and she was placed in an incubator on a, vent on a ventilator. She was big enough she could fit in the palm of your hand tiny little white blonde hair on her head which only showed up in the comparison to the colour of her skin which lived up to her name. Her mother, Rakina, now my wife, was just 17 at the time and the same night was told her baby had only 2% chance of surviving the night. Amethyst battled for every second of her life that night. And the following morning, a Catholic police stood by her bedside in tears as he christened the tiny little baby in her incubator. Amethyst <clears throat> had been so poorly that Rakina hadn't even been able to give her daughter a cuddle still. Amethyst fought and fought and finally on her tenth day she was well enough to be transferred to Southampton General Hospital or Niku, which back then was back on G1 and her doctor didn't have that much good news for Rikina either, telling her there was nothing they'd be able to do and he would be sending her back to the Isle of Wight. Rikina was staying with her aunt in Eastleigh, a wonderful but formidable woman that demanded a second opinion from the doctors. They said that they didn't think he would be make a difference but they would send her to Guy's Hospital in London for a second opinion. Rakina's Auntie Betty arranged for somewhere for Rakina to stay and they were rushed by ambulance to Guy's Hospital. At Guy's they met Professor Haycock, a world-known nephrologist, specialist. He ordered a bunch of tests and as soon as they arrived Amethyst had been born with autosinal infantile polycystic kidney syndrome. She would need a kidney transplant eventually. Her prognostics wasn't wonderful, but it was far less catastrophic than the doctors at Southampton had given her. He was a kind man and said to Rikina he could and would treat her daughter. Amethyst stayed in the 12th floor of Guy's Hospital on Arthur Far Ward for about a few weeks. Then when she was stable enough was moved downstairs to level 9 into Dickens Ward, the renal unit. She suffered her first stroke during her stay. On the 3rd of December 1994 she was released from hospital to go home for the first time ever. Rakina remembered being terrified. She was sent home from hospital with 26 medications that Rakina had to administrate, along with specialist diets, fluids and restrictions. For the first few months, if Amethyst wasn't in the hospital as an admission, she had at least one weekly visit to go to Guy's Hospital, all the way from her home on the Isle of Wight. After a few months, this turned into monthly visits. Amethyst was just coming up to two years old when she had an illness that nobody could work out. So a consultant at the local hospital, St Mary's on the Isle of Wight, sent her to guys for admission to see if, if they could work it out. After a week, Professor Haycock said that he had no idea, but he could see something was wrong. 
He asked Rakina if she remembered back when Amethyst was a baby, that she was under the lights in the incubator and she was very jaundiced, but it sorted itself out so they thought it was fixed. It was the only thing he could think of to have to arrange for her to be sent to King's College Hospital across London, a few miles in Camberwell. When they got there, they met Dr. Dina Hasdick, another world-renowned doctor, this time in the field of hepatology. He arranged for Amethyst to have a number of tests. He explained them all to Vicina and what they were testing for and how these diseases would affect Amethyst if she should have them and their treatments, but said to think positively and he thought it would be none of them. So Amethyst went off to have some of the tests done under general anaesthetic. After she come back from the theatre, Rakina said she instantly knew something bad was about to be revealed, as the children's bed in the children's hospital or ward are always a sacred, safe place. If nothing bad is said or done unless it is absolutely critical. Dino arrived at Amethyst's bedside and asked Rakina to follow him to the family room, then told her that she did indeed have the worst case scenario that he had discussed with her a few hours before. He said that she had Hepatic, he said that she had hepatic fibrosis known as Carlio syndrome of the liver. She would require liver and kidney transplant. Kina was devastated. It felt as if every time Amethyst went to hospital, she came home with more meds and more diagnosis. A few months later, 26th of November, Rakina went to wake Amethyst up to go to the guys for a routine appointment and discovered her being sick. The hospital driver, waiting to take her to guys, said he would instead rush her to St Mary's to get her seen. Amethyst was severely ill, unable to keep anything in. The doctors did a lumbar puncture on her, suspecting meningitis, but came back with another diagnosis. Amethyst had E. coli septicemia in her prognosis. For once, again devastating, it was that year that started the traditions in our house that's still going on to this day. With the tree and decorations going up the same day every year, the 27th of November, our house is decorated for Christmas. Akuna was told to give her Amethyst a Christmas day as it was unlikely she would make it to Christmas that year. So that's what the whole family did. On the 27th of November, the tree went up and all the other decorations, they had Christmas dinner and presents. They told the other kids of the family they were just practicing for the real Christmas. After the Christmas day, Rakina returned to the hospital with Amethyst but over the coming days, Amethyst once again defied the odds and pulled through, making it the real Christmas and far beyond. Over time, Amethyst defied the doctors at all their predictions. She wouldn't walk, she did. She wouldn't talk, she does. And sometimes won't shut up. She'd never reached school age. Professor Sue Rigdon at Guy's Hospital, and yes, you've guessed it, world renowned in her field of ufology. Professor Sue Rigdon at Guy's Hospital, and yes, you've guessed it, world renowned in her field of ufology, welled up when she was handed a photo of Amethyst as Mary in her first school nativity play at St George's Nursery. Amethyst was a miracle in the eyes of everyone that met her. 
when she was six. Though her kidneys had been in chronic failure for some time and her body couldn't work with them anymore, leading to another stroke. And the doctors were removing both kidneys and placing her on hemodialysis. She would travel every other day to Guy's Hospital for about a year to the Timbo Ward on Level 4, a unit that was named after the son of Elizabeth Ward, OBE. Timbo developed an acute kidney condition at 13. Elizabeth fought successfully for him to receive life-saving treatment at hospital as well as at home. Not only that, but she decided to campaign to raise money and awareness to cause of kidney disease. She set out tirelessly to help others in the same situation. It was because of her that there was the introduction of the kidney donor card and she started the charity, the British Kidney Patients Association, or BKPA, for short base, in Alton in Hampshire. Sadly, Timbo lost his battle against illness in 1987. But that never slowed Elizabeth down. She tirelessly campaigned for other patients that were in the same position. Rakina and Amethyst had the privilege of meeting her while Amethyst was on dialysis after a new unit opened, G4 Nepro back in Southampton General, which Amethyst would travel to every other day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, until the night of August the 9th, 2004. It was Monday evening, <coughs> and after a day of Amethyst being on dialysis, Rikina was just locking up the house to go to bed. And just after 10pm, the phone rang. Tired, but knowing at this time of night, the call must be important. She answered the phone, worried she was about to get some bad news. An ill family member, she had asked the person at the other end of the phone to repeat themselves, not because she didn't hear them but because she didn't believe what she actually was getting the call for. Yes, of course, sorry, this is the transplant coordinator. We have a liver and kidney for amethyst. We're just arranging transport off the island. Be ready, someone will be with you within the hour. We can over called how she almost fell over and went into a mad panic as she had four other children and needed childcare. Between her, her ex-husband, they set about calling family members and getting all the kids gathered up for an emotional, exciting and eventually terrifying goodbye. The paramedics turned up and loaded up Amethyst into the car with a suitcase that had been packed <laughs> almost three years just sat by the door for this occasion every few months it was emptied and things would be replaced it was either getting close to sell by dates or it wouldn't fit as amethyst anymore but this time it was there almost freshly packed by a week the boat left the East Cow's dock early with an apology and an explanation to the other passengers about their favourite passenger, Amethyst, who had deployed a good relationship with the Red Vinyl and Red Jet staff over the past 10 years of travel on board their vessels. The boat was deafening with applause and cheers as the announcement The boat was deafening with applause and the cheers of the announcement. 
The boat was also given special permission to make a faster journey than the usual shorter crossing. Went past in a blur as people came to wish them good luck and a speedy recovery. All Amethyst was worried about was being able to have a McDonald's after her transplant. When the boat docked, the gates opened and the paramedics sped off to the sound of the ship's horn salute in Amethyst. England at this time was being backed by high winds. Rakina still recalls a drive at 110 miles an hour blues and twos all the way to Birmingham. It's one of the most terrifying car rides of her life not made any less scary than the M40 police started escorting the car and using the piggyback manoeuvre to keep cars out of the way. All the way to Birmingham's Children's Hospital. Amethyst absolutely bursting with excitement, laughing, squealing for the paramedic to drive faster. The next few hours were tests after tests to make sure that Amethyst was fit as she could be for the 13 hour operation that was ahead of her. The agonising wait for something to get going at the same time a wish that time could either stand still or they could forget the call ever come through and carry on as it had been. You see it's always just assumed that the parents are thrilled but there is so much more to the whole thought process. Firstly, until the organs are inside the recipient and verified to be working properly, nothing is for sure, and even then, there are no guarantees that they will still continue working. There was a chance Amethyst could die on the table, and in the coming days, weeks, or months, higher than the ordinary risk of in an operation. There's the wait to know your loved one made it through. And then one of the hardest things Rakina had to get through is knowing that someone else, someone else's child, had to die to save hers. The guilt is unbearable because she knows how close she had been losing her own daughter and how hard that grief would be to think of a mother in grief of losing her child and having the strength, love, courage within her to allow her child's organs to be used to save others' lives. That is bravery. That is courage. That's a true hero. And we wish we could tell her that. Sadly, at that time, it was not allowed for the recipients to know who the donors were, or vice versa. Rakina was outside having a crafty cigarette as the weight was getting to her, while Amethyst was on the last blast of dialysis. When there was a lot of commotion going on, she asked the security guard what was happening, and he said, there was a helicopter landing in the street and it had donor organs on board. She realised this was it. Those were for Amethyst. She ran in and the staff already had Amethyst on the trolley about to leave for the theatre. It was the shortest and longest walk of their lives. Amethyst was allowed to inject her own magic milk the name they give the anaesthetic so as not to frighten the babies. Then that was that. She was asleep. Rakina kissed her on her head and was ushered out of the room with a promise that she would be updated regularly. That was the longest night of Rakina's life still exhausted from the night before with no sleep but too worried for Amethyst to sleep. She had a phone call from the team letting her know so far so good and from concerned family and friends but eventually she managed to have a bit of a catnap before the phone rang again around 6am.
and the overwhelming fantastic news, Amethyst was on her way to recovery room. And so far, the operation had run to textbook. Bikini was told that she would need to wait a little while before she could see her to get some rest for an hour or two and by then she would be on the ICU. When she reached the ICU, Amethyst was supposed to be awake and trying to fight the ventilator out of her mouth. The doctor took it out and did warn Rikina it was too soon, really. But as she was awake and desperately fighting it, they would see how she went without it. As soon as it was out, Amethyst turned to Rikina and asked if we were at McDonald's. Amethyst had her own team in the room dedicated for the next week of solely her care. They were fantastic with her. Later that evening, Amethyst started to struggle again. So they put her back onto the ventilator to give her a rest. That afternoon, there had also been some real positive news. Amethyst's new kidney was working. The catheter bag had the first few drips of urine. For this, some is odd news. Why would it be so exciting? It was so exciting because Amethyst hadn't passed urine in more than two years since her kidney had been removed. Rikina became a celebrity in the hospital for excitingly blurting it out when a local Isle of Wight reporter had travelled up that week to interview her on Amethyst's condition. A little did she know the story was picked up by other news stations and many people approached her. She even got a call from Amethyst's grandmother in Kent laughing that someday Amy would not thank her. Amethyst faced a long recovery, an unexpected four month stay in hospital. McKinney's parents visited her on the way to go into the airport on holiday to America that they had booked a year before. They said they'd do the same on the way home. They'd brought Carl, Amethyst's elder brother, up to stay with Kina and Amethyst. Amethyst is now on the HDU where the dedicated team were teaching Makina her new medications and physio exercise to help with the post-op. Carl even got stuck in helping her and they had so many giggles together, seeing her just seven days after the op, sitting up, out of bed, eating, drinking and playing with her brother despite all the tubes and monitors and the two large cuts on her abdomen was unreal to Rikina and all that saw Amethyst, that young girl, is stronger than you can imagine. I haven't even touched the surface of some of the things this brave girl has gone through, and even reading this back, I'm in awe of her courage and her strength. On the 27th of August, Rikina had a phone call to the ward. It was her brother, David. He'd asked for the directions to the ward from the lift, Rikina got the shock of her life when in walked her brother, his wife, and their baby, and his brother-in-law, who kindly had driven them up to see her. But they all got the shock of their lives when the doctors came in and said something they had never imagined possible. We think as long as you're ready, you can go home. Amethyst had shown such amazing resilience and made such a remarkable recovery that they said she could go home and have twice a weekly appointments at Southampton General. David and the rest helped to load the stuff into Pete's car and also the hospital car, which thanks to the generosity, love and kindness from total strangers in Birmingham and on the Isle of Wight and some places in between that have seen the infamous news report was still a massive squeeze due to the hospital receiving mountains of posts. There were beautiful gifts, lots of Shrek stuff, which Amy's favourite thing at the time. 
cards galore but they squeezed it all in and a few hours later were shocking their loved ones back at home. And just in time the following day was Arapis' youngest sister's Tyler's birthday, a day Rakina had been dreading spending away from her. Time passed and Amethyst went from strength to strength. She had an operation on her leg a couple of years after her transplant, which helped her mobility, ultimately, but it did take her a while to learn to walk properly again, as the op threw her off her. Then she had a minor grommet operation on her ear. Again, she took it in her stride and just breezed through it. On her 18th birthday, we threw a huge party for her, just before she had a routine appointment at Birmingham with Dr. Patrick McKinnon, a straight talking Irish doctor that had been one of the amazing team there at Amethyst Transplant. Rakina asked a question. Amethyst begged to ask, would Amethyst be allowed an alcoholic drink just to toast on her 18th birthday as a rite of passage, a celebration for her birthday? we have never meant to have shared. The doctor asked Rakina, how much would she normally drink? And Rakina, confused, said her fluid limit, 3,000 millilitres. The doctor's voice went high pitched as he said in an Irish accent, of alcohol? To which Rakina replied, God no, she's only had to have a drop of wine at Christmas time with a splash of lemonade. Before that, she'd never really had alcohol because of her liver and kidneys. I'm not sure what stumped him more, the fact that he thought she was drinking three litres of alcohol a day, or the fact that it sat with an 18-year-old girl who's never really drunk any alcohol before. <laughs> to Amethyst delight, he said, oh my gosh then, have it, that girl. You go have yourself a grand old night. He told myself and Rakina that she was very rare as it was sad to see youngsters back in hospital after the transplant due to how much they drink. Amethyst had her party and had a glass of her words, vodka and coke, and a few more cheeky WKD blues, and danced the night away dressed as Cinderella with her loved ones in a fancy dress. That was almost 11 years ago. Amethyst will be 29 this year, she has her own flat in a complex for people with learning difficulties and is as stubborn and headstrong as ever. But her mum and I, thankful for that streak, because as frustrating and infuriating as it can be, it's that streak that has kept her alive for all the pain and heartache that a young woman has battled through and continues to battle through even now. She's truly a miracle and an honest to goodness hero because through her pain and illness she laughs and she loves and she never stops fighting. She never gives up. Her courage and heart are second to none. We are so proud of everything she has overcome and continues to overcome. But Amethyst also would not be here without those other heroes that helped along the way. Her extended family and friends that supported her and her family jumping in to babysit or to lift to the hospital and much more but mostly their unconditional love and support which we will all be eternally grateful for and then the most crucial are medical teams in this country we are blessed with the NHS and amethyst saviours and heroes have been people like Professor Haycock, Ridgen Hadzik, St Mary's Docks, Dr Watson, Dr Galati, and Dr Rolison. Sorry, still she susses you out as Santa at the Christmas party. All the fantastic nurses she has met along her way, like Merrin, Joe, Helen, Pam, Anne, John, Sam, and Catherine to name, and a few of St Mary's children ward on the Isle of Wight. Her G4 and Nephro family, 
Esther, Maggie, Ruth, Kevin, Pete and Sarah and not forgetting Dr Rodney Gilbert and Dr Panka and also Dr Nagra and the amazing Dr Patrick McKinnon and his first class team at Birmingham Children's Hospital and to the amazing nurses and doctors that continue to do the hardest, most unrecognised, underpaid and most undervalued job. We thank you too. We also like to mention other NHS professionals like the pharmacists and dietitians, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, occupation therapists, porters and paramedics. You are all heroes. We need to protect our NHS. These guys are awesome. Also, the other families that we became friends with along the way and through shared traumas are bonds for life. Like Jessica and Lee with Jamie who helped make the days easier to cope with. Or Aidan and his mum who sadly passed away but has been wonderful to watch Aidan grow into a fantastic man. And many more. Sadly like Amethyst, there are also the losses the goodbyes of lives taken too soon because their organs weren't available. Some taken even when they were available, sadly. <coughs> That's why the donor system is so important. And thanks to people like the medical professionals we have encountered Lives are saved every day to the heroics of them and the constant improvements of the medical world. But the most importantly, until recently, with the change of the law to opt out instead of opt in, many lives have been saved or changed for the better because somebody who was going through the worst day of their lives had the strength and courage to allow their loved ones to be donors after their tragic passing. And obviously, the people who wanted their deaths to be not in vain and to selfishly nominate themselves for the donor list in the event of their passing. And then, the courage to make their feelings known to their loved ones. All heroes on their own, rights, all worthy of a video. Lastly, some heroes of ours I almost forgot are children. Firstly, the Keeners, other children, Donna, Carl, Tyler and Jodin all grow up knowing barely any difference from the life without medical people in and out of their homes and lives and missing out on things other kids took for granted due to ill-timed Ill hospital admissions and appointments that all show an amethyst nothing but love and supporting her always. Then my children too, Katie, Charlene, Terry, Lauren, Paige, Gypsy and Kevin Jr. who did know different but adapted when our families blended. These kids are all shown massive resilience, are all grown now with their own families or own things going on as adults. There were times it was hard, there seemed to be no light at the end of the tunnel but that life we all dealt with different cards and we make the most of it. Rakina has constantly been asked over Amethyst's life, how did you do it? Rakina has always said that she doesn't understand that question as you just do it. You wake up every morning and you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. It didn't matter how hard things seem to you because there's always going to be someone out there having a worse day than you. And you owe it to that person to keep going.
Thank you for watching. Please like and share and maybe subscribe to see more content. Please comment below. I love to see people's stories and I love to hear what you think. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Until then, take care and thank you much for